at the moment, the first one is 1994 one. I don't think much is going to change because we both know what our dead last is. Last in this of rankings is the 2019 version. There is no discussion on that. When you asked me, can we do a ranking? I was like, do we have to watch the 2019? No. It is dead last. That movie has grained my brain so much. There are times when I just randomly think about it. Nobody but me. I am just sitting in my room. I hate that, that moment. I told my mom when we were watching it the first time, I said, you know, don't trick me. Because they added these little things and I am like, oh, that was in the book. I have never seen anyone doing, but then I think about it and it is just not right. Somebody mentioned that in the book at some point, Amy wants to expand her skills in art from beyond painting. She tries to do sculpting and she puts plaster in the bucket and puts her foot in it. She is trying to learn how to do that. That is the motivation behind it. The 2019 film Amy's Motivation is do something to Lori to remind him of her pretty feet. Just so you know, everybody, 2019 Lori has a foot fetish. When I saw that, I was like, oh my God, it just keeps getting worse. I just look back on it and I reevaluate a lot of things I thought were okay. I have seen a lot of reviews that are like, oh, I thought that apron scene was actually pretty good. And I am like, was it though now that I am really thinking about it, it wasn't as hot and heavy as people try to make it be pride and prejudice, hand flexing scene. It is not. That film is a train wreck and it is rightfully at the bottom of the list. It is funny about that foot thing because I was thinking, well, if we have this Amy who in the movie is 20 something, why would a 20 something person give a sculpture of their foot to a guy that doesn't make any sense i have to say i don't want to criticize her acting in general because i only have seen her in one thing but florence Pugh is the worst amy i rather listen to the 1978 amy whine and screech than have to deal with florence Pugh's amy because i feel like hers is almost borderline psychopath just the way that she so calmly talks about why she burned the book I was just like, are you kidding me? My mom, I have seen few more adaptations than she has. She hasn't seen the 70s one of the Masterpiece Theater, but she has seen all the other ones, and her name is Amy, too. She always feels a little defensive towards Amy, but she was like, wow, this is the first time I don't like Amy, and she has read the book, like, once or twice. She was like, I am not too familiar with everything in the book, like the way you are but even then she still watches the adaptations of, but she was like this amy i don't like her and I say it is more in the script i don't exactly want to criticize the actress because i have not seen her in anything else so i don't know how i feel about her acting in general but i just do not like florence Pugh as amy here as a child definitely not and i am just kind of mm, as her as an adult but I think that is again just the script because she just goes on on however she is on the contrary in the book it is Laurie that chases Amy down the street when she is in the carriage but in this movie she is the one that chases Laurie down and acts kind of ridiculous screaming and whatever else totally not in character with Amy I think it was Greta Gerwig who said Oh, we admire these girls because they don't want to grow up. And I'm like, no, Amy wants to grow up if you read the book. Joe also wants to grow up if you read the book. Amy wants to know what it is like to be a woman. She wants to become a mature person, a true lady. But then when I watched this movie, I wish that I had seen it. That moment when Aunt March comes and she says, Amy is going to Europe with me. Just so you know, there isn't any explanation given why Cho cannot go because they didn't include the scene from chapter course. But Amy is like, why nobody is happy for me? And then Mommy goes, my poor Cho, you really should have gotten the trip. I wanted to smash the screen when I saw that. It is so completely opposite to the book because in the book, Amy feels bad for Cho. And mommy says, no, Joe, you caused your own misery. You were rude to the ads. That is why you lost the trip. 
It is so confusing because we are supposed to see Amy as this mature person who can handle things, and then she just complains that nobody is happy for her. I cannot admire this Amy, and I cannot admire this Joe. They behave like little kids when they are supposed to be adults. There's not even like a half-pass line like, oh, well, I am taking Amy with me to Europe because Amy and I get along better than you and I ever did. It is true. That is something that at some point someone says in the book, whether it was Aunt March or Joe, they say we wouldn't have gotten along better. Amy's going with me, and it sucks to be you, Joe. Amy really did not, again, gain any sympathy from me when she was there. Like, why is nobody being happy for me? The film is so confusing for me. I like Laura Dern. I think in general, she is a wonderful actress, but all I can say that Marmee in this one is like a soccer mom. I am not like a regular mom. I am a cool mom. When Lori first comes and meets Marmee, he says, oh, hello, Mrs. March. He's like, oh, just call me Marmee. Everybody does. What? No. The one moment that really gets me regards on how Marmee reacts to something in the trailer we see the girls messing around in their own home, and Marmier says to Laurie, my girls can be a bit of a handful. Okay, let's say that at home they can be wild little animals. Then what happens in the movie is after Amy hurts her hand, and she is babbling to Laurie and whatever, she and the sisters go inside the Lawrence's house, and they're all jumping all over the place, screaming. They're acting like banshees. I don't care if it was back then or today. No good parent would just allow their kid to just go nuts. Joe is over cushions, and they put their hands on everything without acting respectfully. Marmee is just like, oh yeah, this is just how my girls are. And I am like, if I had acted that way in a stranger's house, I probably would have had a whipping. I would have probably be grounded. No TV for a week or something like that. I got secondhand embarrassment from just seeing that especially on that time period, how do you sit there and just go like, oh yeah, this is totally fine? Mari would have never have allowed it because she still wants them to act like respectable people. Obviously not to dampen their spirits or to take away anything, act like adults, act like human beings. I had so many problems with this film. We talked earlier about Uncle March. But you know how in this movie Aunt March is supposed to be a spinster. And this really bothers me. If she is a spinster, why is she constantly trying to marry off these girls? According to Gerwig, she's supposed to be this model for an independent woman for Joe. But then she constantly wants the girls to marry rich. Isn't that contradicting? It is. Other thing, too, is it makes Aunt March seem even meaner because if she is not ever married and she is rich, I am thinking of that moment when Aunt March is like, oh, you need to marry rich. And Joe is like, you are not married. And she is like, that is because I'm rich. It makes Aunt March seem even meaner because if she is rich by whatever means it is, why isn't she helping the family versus her being married into it? It just kind of seems like, I presume, I don't really know much of the economics of the marriage, what it was back then. I feel like marrying into money, even if you are a widow, you still have very limited access to your husband's money. Whereas in this, it seems like, oh yeah, I got the money on my own, but I can't give you the money for whatever reason, because I am a Scrooge McDuck type of person. That is what it felt like to me. They were clearly suffering financially, and she was just not helping in any way. It made Aunt March a lot colder than I think she should have been. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense to me because if she is this rich pinster, why does she want everyone to get married? All the listeners who don't know, Aunt March in the book had a husband who she loved very, very much. Her husband died. They had a daughter. She died. And that made her a very grudgy, unhappy, lonely lady. Even though she's a millionaire, she's not happy. Not at all. You can almost kind of see that her wanting to push the girls to marry as sort of seeing the girls as her own daughters. I want to make sure you are okay. I just immediately think of this movie from Betty Davis called Old Maid 
great movie for the time when it was made. At, at least in my opinion, it was a little scandalous how they managed to get away with it. But her character has a child at a wedlock and she goes to live with her sister-in-law who has taken care of her daughter and she has no idea she is her daughter and she pretends to be like this aunt who is very stern on her. She's worried that she will let it slip somehow, even being affectionate towards her that she is the mother in some way. I always see Aunt March being that way. Like, I can't show how much I care because she worries that something bad will happen if she does or I got to be stern. That way I can lead them into direction they need to go. But I have never seen Aunt March being this wholly unfeeling individual just kind of stern and wanting what is best for the girls. Here, I just kind of felt like she wasn't as nice as she could have been. You know, there was an older version of the script where it didn't have this split ending, but Jo did end up with Fredrik and he was German. And I read that script before I watched the movie. And then I was very confused because it was completely different. There was another script where Jo wanted to punch Amy when she heard that Laurie and Amy were engaged, which does seem to it does seem to suggest that Greta Gerwig does not like Amy and Laurie as a couple. And we know that Laurie has zero character arc in this movie. We don't see him being this aimless Brad boy like he is in the book and Amy telling him to shape up his act. We don't see him being obnoxious with Joe. There's none of that. And there was also this very disturbing part in the 2019 film guide where she said that Laurie wants Joe to step into adulthood and that Joe is a child and Laurie is an adult. When in the book it is the opposite, Laurie is the child, Joe is the adult. That's why Joe falls in love with Friedrich because Friedrich is an adult and Amy helps Laurie to leave childhood behind and enter into adulthood. And in all these interviews where she has said that how much she loves little woman, it feels total nonsense and that she's lying because she doesn't seem to know these basic plot lines that happen in the novel in the first place. <laughs> I think it was an interview with Vogue where Gerwig said she wants Cyrus Ronan and Timothy Chalamet together in all possible ways. Okay. Then there are these other interviews where she says that Joe should have ended up with Laurie. Then another interview, Joe should have been gay. Third interview, Joe should have been an asexual. If he would have made, for example, Joe to be gay in this movie, or have a full blow Joe and Laurie romance, I might have had more respect for this. But now it is about fishing viewers and it is all about making money. Yes, because you are trying to appeal to every audience who has an opinion on rather than sticking to your gun saying, this is how the story is. I never read the original script. I have seen bits and pieces online, but I feel like if I read it, I am just going to get mad because then I would just go like, that was a much better moment in this script than it is in the movie. And I really don't like the split ending. I truly believe that no matter what ending in this film, Joe is unhappy. If you believe the ending where she gets to publish her book, one, she's lonely. As we establish in the scene with her big monologue, women are brains and brilliance, and I'm sick of it, and I'm lonely. That whole scene and her writing to Laurie saying, please marry me because I'm lonely, which does not happen at all in the book. And in the end, she is lonely. She is still lonely. Sure, she may have gotten her book published, but she is lonely and then she is pressured by her editor to add romance in order to get it published. No matter what, she is not happy in that regardless if her book is published. But then if you follow the ending of Joe gets to be with Friedrich, it is not happy because there is probably like a one scene really or two where you think like, oh, this is actually going to a good direction on Joe's and Friedrich's relationship. But then everything after that spirals out of control with her being like, you are mean and I am not your friend. When he comes to Concord, she is someone happy to see him. But when he leaves and he's like, I will be going to West if you ever come around. And she is like, thank you so much for sharing my love for a little woman. 
All the transcriptions of the Little Woman podcast are now available as paperbacks, ebooks, and as audiobooks on Amazon, Kindle, Nook, and bookstores. You can find all the links from the description. And now, back to the show. No, I don't think I have a reason to come around. It just didn't feel as genuine with the pressure between Amy and Meg being like, you love him, let's get into the carriage and drive off and watch you to run off to him. That whole scene was weird too modern. It felt like she was being pressured to go after Friedrich rather than it being very genuine. So yeah, no matter what, ending in that for Joe is not happy. It makes me very depressed to think about it. To that Enon for saying, I feel sorry for Amy because Lori just wants to be with Joe. I'm depressed by the fact that in 2019 film, Joe is unhappy no matter what. For someone that says how much she loves Joe Gerwig, really, it felt more like she hated Joe. She doesn't care at all about. To be honest, she seems to hate it because she's mistreating it this way. She seemed to have hated Friedrich's character, what I have read her interviews. She complained that she was forced to start a school for boys. If you read the book, Joe is the one who wants to start the school. And she even tells to her family that she had this idea of a school even before she met Friedrich. And Gerwig was like, oh, he forces Joe to stop writing. That never happens in the book. Friedrich is the one who inspires Joe to continue writing. Why did she lie to people? Then it goes on to her making comments on his character, the way he looks, and that he is quite old. Racist, fatphobic comments. It goes back to that old Lori good-looking, Friedrich not-so-good-looking argument. She apparently thinks that Joe is rather pretty. She doesn't pay any attention to that Lori is harassing Joe in the book. Her comments make me go, like, part me kettle. Friedrich is too old for Joe. What about your husband? Yes, what about your child with your husband? I was going to say, there is a pretty good age gap between her and Noah Bumbach. It is pretty close to Joe and Friedrich are because they are 16 and theirs is 13 years. How can you sit there and say that when your own husband is a good 10, what years older? Like you said, she is very hypocritical and it sucks. It really sucks because I really liked Lady Bird. Personally, I thought it was a good movie and I was excited for this little woman because I was like, oh, this director is good and Sours Ronin. I have always liked her, and those two are not entirely romantic. Have you seen Lady Bird? No. I did see Call Me By Your Name, and I thought he does good emotional roles, but I was really disappointed with Laurie because he didn't do anything, basically. He was just there standing being pretty. In Lady Bird, at one point, their characters try to be a couple. So Urs Ronan's character is clearly interested in him, and they kind of have a thing but it comes across and I think it is rightfully so their characters come across being awkward together because he is very blowsy about everything the reason why her character likes him is because he is sort of a cool outsider who doesn't really care about anything what she wants I was like okay they have good screen chemistry together so this is gonna be good in terms of I can see them having good screen chemistry as Joe and Laurie, but I was like, hmm, I don't like how they were trying to push it. It still felt very awkward trying to make something happen. There is that, I don't know what cartoon it is from, but like this character is trying to put two people together. And I feel like that is how Gerwig was just like, you no know, kiss. And it is not going to work. They're just not going to be that couple. They are great friends. I have seen interviews with them and they are really adorable together as friends. But I don't know if I can see them as a romantic couple. They just don't have that feeling for me. No, I feel kind of bad for them. And I don't really know that much about either. There's this whole chapter in Little Woman 2019 Film Guide where Gerwig talks about how she wanted to make fun of Joe's and Friedrich's relationship. And I read that and I was like, this person doesn't know anything about Louisa May Alcott. And when I have read Gerwig's interviews, she is like, Oh, Louisa May Alcott hated marriage. Louisa May Alcott hated this and that. And I'm like, 
if you had read any Louisa May Alcott diaries, you would know that she had a fling with the real-life Laurie and that she was in love with Henry David Thoreau. And to me, you know, the whole thing about this split ending, either Jo ends up with this guy who in the movie she doesn't seem to be that interested or she's independent and lonely for the rest of her life, the book publishing part fails because the book is based on Louisa May Alcott's real life relationships with the real life Laurie and the real life Friedrich. If you erase those relationships, like Gerwig is trying to do, you don't have the book, you don't have the story, it disappears. This movie would not exist if Louisa May Alcott didn't have those real life relationships. Gerwig felt to me like she didn't do as much research. I think at one point I said Gerwig just read the clip notes on a query search. It felt like she was very dependent upon the myth and the stories of her editor pushed her to marry Joe off, as I have learned from you. No, she didn't. No, the editor never did. Not for Joe, not for Meg, not for anybody. And to say, no, she didn't want her to be married in whatever urban myths that are added into the world of Little Women It felt very much like she was just going off with that rather than having actually read the book and done her own research. It is more like fan fiction if you think about it. That makes me think of someone. And Anon, who said 2019 Little Women is bad fan fiction discussed. I'm like, oh, absolutely. (laughs) That weird thing I can never get out of my head because it just absolutely ruined me where someone wrote a fan fiction where Teddy... Joseph Friedrich's son is actually Laurie's son. It has ruined me, and I hate to say that it had kind of ruined for me Joe naming Teddy after Laurie for me because I just never can't get that fic out of my head. I know some people will say that is silly. It is just a fan fic, but like, ah. So that is why my modern day story doesn't have Theodore at all. I just keep having these flashbacks of that fan fic, and it just ruined it for me. And it really felt like a bad dream, some bad version of a wonderful novel. When I read her interviews, it was always a different story in a different interview. She kind of ruined her movie to me with these interviews because, I mean, she is a celebrity. A lot of people know her name. Millions of people read her interviews. And if they read her interviews where she says, oh, Joe marries this horrible German. And then she makes these racist comments about him. And Greta Gerwig has the most German name in Hollywood, by the way. She has German ancestry. People are going to buy your narrative because they see you as an authority. And you just lie to people and even encourage xenophobia. You are doing nothing to help to change the narrative of what Little Women is. Like, you are embedding sort of toxic myth of what the story is and ruining what Alcott felt. I feel like she is probably rolling in her grave with that adaptation, with the way people are getting her character wrong. And I hate to say this way because I am in no place to judge anyone who is trying to, like, make a canon character to be LGB type. But it bothers me when people headcan a character as an LGBT when it is based on a misinformation, when people say, oh, Joe must be a transgender because... She prefers to be a boy, but she is not saying that she prefers to be a boy because she feels in her heart that she is a boy. She wants to do boyish things because, again, time period when boys had more power, more control over things than girls did. Nobody is thinking of that. They are just thinking of what they see on the surface. I saw an article. I didn't read it. It wasn't working for me, but I saw someone putting on an article questioning, oh, was Louisa May Alcott herself transgender unless you have some serious evidence that she was other than the fact that Joe her character who is her avatar wanted to be a boy that must be case enough to prove that she wanted to be a boy herself I am not buying it again I feel like if you can back it up with something that is not just a stereotype of a LGBT fine because I personally have Canon Joe as being a demisexual, demi romantic, but I can at least back it up with what I think and having it be legit rather than to be just like 
because I just want her to be or because of this false conception that I have of a character and how I think Louisa May Alcott would have wanted her character to be. I have seen people get mad when I am like, I don't agree with Joe being a lesbian. There is not evidence in that. There's more evidence of Amy being bisexual than Joe being gay. Seriously, I think at one point she is looking at her classmate. She says she is pretty. To me, Joe being gay theory fails pretty much in the beginning because Joe doesn't really like women in the book. She doesn't like to hang out with girls. And with all the lesbians that I know, they usually naturally go to hang out with the girls. I think that is one of the biggest key points of being a lesbian is being into girls. Joyce very much into boys. First, she wants the freedom that the boys have. But then when she meets Friedrich, oh my gosh, one of my favorite scenes in the book, she literally moves the couch in the nursery so she can stare at him all day long. And then there are all these comments Oh, I love that he's so masculine and he has these big hands and big feet and Laurie is so girly. Laurie is so feminine. Not to mention, if you read other Louisa May Alcott books, you see the Friedrich-like character always as the love interest because he's based on Henry David Thoreau and Louisa May Alcott was in love with him. Joe loves very manly, masculine man and it is not just little woman. That same narrative exists in all of Louisa May Alcott novels. There's a lot of praise for smart, caring, masculine-looking men in her books. There are also moments in the book where Jo wants to be very feminine. She likes to knit. She likes to make dresses. She loves being a mom. And the 2019 film, it was all about money and queer baiting. And I am not a fan of that. And I think now with Barbie movie, people are starting to see Greta Gerwig as the way she truly is, someone who tries to make money with clickbait feminism. It is not authentic. Novels, And I had not read the script, the early drafts of it, or any of the interviews before, and I already did not like the movie once I saw it. But now sharing those interviews and sharing those quotes and all that, it makes me not only hate the movie more like from genuinely cannot tolerate it to absolutely hating it. At this point, almost I would be worried if she would have her hands on another adaptation that I would like or even an adaptation that other people would like because I don't want anybody else to go through that misery as well because just like I know a lot of fans of Game of Thrones had that very disappointing ending and we at the Star Wars community were like, we are so sorry and then we got our disappointing ending and all the Game of Thrones fans were like, we totally understand. That is what I feel like if Jerwig ever got her hands on an adaptation of a beloved novel or it is a beloved novel to somebody else and she just ruins it, I would feel bad for that person because nobody should have their favorite novel get ruined. I feel so bad for the fans of Persuasion. I need to read the book. Someone gave me a collection of four stories of Jane Austen and I see people just rip the new Persuasion off because it is so bad and I am like, I feel so bad for you. I understand how you feel. I got my own dose of a bad adaptation and of a beloved classic. It is becoming a weird trend lately doing stuff like that. It is weird because postmodernism is based on this idea that nothing is real. And Greta Gerwig's films are described to be postmodern. But if you want to make a period drama that is based on a book, which is based on someone's life, I don't think that should be postmodern. She's trying to sell herself as this feminist person, but then you have Joe, who in the movie suddenly wants back a character who in the book abuses her. Where is the feminism in that? You make these complaining comments about character being German, and you don't like his accent, and you pretty much feel racism among your fans. Joe in the book loves that Friedrich is German, and Louisa May Alcott was a Germanophile, you say that you love the writer, and yet you make a mockery of the things that were important to the writer. Where is the feminism in that? All these comments about how this movie is made by woman for woman? There are all these previous little woman adaptations that were made by woman for woman, and then you just steal stuff from there that you just want to fit into your version? 
Somebody said that Christian Bell's hairstyle is similar to Timothy Chalamet's. That version, it was really tried to play it to the masses because here is the thing. I feel like if you are going to be a filmmaker or a writer or whatever, you are going to have to be decisive and stick to your guns no matter what people are going to think. But it felt like Gerwig knew that people were going to be mad if Joe is going to end up with Friedrich. And if she ends up with Lori, people are going to be mad at that. But then you have Joe and Lori together. You have people who ship either Lori and Amy or Friedrich and Joe together getting mad. So she tried to make something that was middle ground to make everybody happy, but she just made it worse. Can we talk about Emma Watson in this film? Because I have a problem with her. I don't like the live action Beauty and the Beast. And I have heard people saying that Emma Watson should have played Joe because she's Belle and Belle is like Joe. Linda Woolverton, who wrote the 1991 Beauty and the Beast, the animated version, which is one of my all-time favorite movies, she was inspired by Catherine Hepburn's Joe in the 1933 Little Woman. So there is a connection between Belle and Joe, but then in the live-action version, I didn't feel any kind of chemistry between the Beauty and the Beast, but also because of the queer baiting. They were promoting the film we now have the first Disney LGBT character in LeFou. LeFou is actually one of the most horrible presentations of an LGBT character. He is a mockery of a gay character. It is a stereotype of the way especially straight men see a gay character. And when I was watching the movie, I remember thinking to myself that it's a very offensive way to portray a gay character. And I was quite disgusted that the movie was promoted with that. And Emma Watson has this brand that she is this clever feminist. She is Belle and she is Hermione. And people were disappointed that she played Meg. Meg is a great character in the book, incredibly overlooked by many, sadly. This is where the 1994 film gets Meg right and the 2019 film erases her entire growth. Reda Gerwig was like, Oh, when Meg goes to Vanity Fair, she should get a day off for being this struggling person. She needs to enjoy herself. I think this was in the 2019 film guide. Gerwig was like, Meg settles for a poor man. It felt like Gerwig wanted Meg to marry a rich man. And sometimes I feel the same when she speaks about Joe and Friedrich, that Joe should have stayed with Laurie because Laurie was rich. And that doesn't make any sense because... The film was made in 2019, not in the 1950s. Joe can combine career, family and love, and Amy does as well. So they don't need to make this choice. You need to be either an independent spinster or be married and not to have a career, which is such an old-fashioned way to think about Little Woman, because in Little Woman, the woman combined the two. But in the movie, when Meg goes to Vanity Fair, she doesn't have that growth. In the book, she is in the company of girls who treat her like a doll. They are not her friends. Gerwig says that we are just supposed to see her having fun or having a day off from her, quote, miserable life. But in the book, it is the vanity fair that makes her miserable. She is not treated well by these girls. They make her feel like she's lesser than them. In the book, Meg doesn't feel like her life is terrible. Even though the family is poor, the family is still pretty happy and pretty content. It is such an amazing scene in the 1994 film when you can see that Meg feels very uncomfortable in that place when the girls are dressing her up and trying to make her presentable. And then she has that discussion about the silk and how her father took a black child to their school and they had to close the school because of that. They don't buy silk because they are against child labor. You see how Meg is a strong character, but all of that was entirely erased from Gerwig's film. This is interesting because the film guy talked about the scene, Meg's meltdown scene, with the silk, how she and John had a big argument. And then I heard later on that it was not in the final film because of Emma Watson's acting skills. And in general... James Norton had to carry her throughout most of her scenes. 
I felt that the film really pushed Meg and Beth aside in order trying to make room for Joe and Amy. This film really do it is the Joe show, but they put Joe and Amy in such a contrast between each other that it felt she was constantly trying to pit Joe and Amy against each other. I felt like Gerwig was trying to put some sort of commentary on it, and then she was like, oh, Meg and Beth are just air. They're just there kind of push on the story to push Joe and Amy stories along. It didn't feel very genuine, and I felt like we really did lose a lot with them as much as the actresses did try, and I liked Eliza Scanlon to play Beth. I have seen her in another movie, and I like her a lot. I think she did her best with Beth, but I hate to say, I didn't feel too much when she passed. It is one thing to be clever with your parallels or your visual quests. In the 1994 we see Joe wearing red dresses, and we see Beth wearing that later, and we see Meg wearing a blue dress, and later on we see Amy wearing it, but I sort of knew it was going to come because you had already set up the same scene when Beth is out. Joe wakes up, and she goes to the kitchen and sees Marmy with Beth, and the second time wakes up alone and goes to the kitchen and sees Marmy alone. 2019, it didn't have the same impact. There could have been an again. I think it is such a shame because one, we don't dive into either one of those sisters' emotional storylines exactly compared to Joe and Amy, and that is supposed to be one of the most heart-wrenching moments in the book, and we lose that. It felt like Jurawig had, in a way, favorites, but then also torturing those favorites. You just want them to suffer because, I don't know, that is what makes great art. I do feel like their characters were pushed aside. Somebody said that the guy that plays John, James Norton, I like. He is a British actor. He has been in quite a few things. He was in the most recent War and Peace with Lily James. I have seen a lot of people and his fans who were very excited to go to see the movie. And then he was barely in it. And when he was there, there wasn't much that he said. I agree. I think he is a great actor, but it is like with Laurie or with Frederick. Gerwig doesn't do anything with the male characters. They are tossed aside. You are supposed to see these couples working on equal grounds with one another. They did not feel very equal partnerships in the way they are supposed to. I think again about the 1994 version, there was an interview in one of these special features documentary commentary when someone said that they did not want it to be just the story of the March sisters, but everybody... And it should be everybody. Gabriel Byrne said, When I was growing up, my mother and my grandmother read us Little Women. I grew up loving it so much. So it is not just a girl's book when you only focus so much on the sisters and you don't give any of the male characters their true story arcs. You are ruining it. There are quite a few great male characters in the story. Chris Cooper is a great actor, but I barely saw his and Beth's relationship. I feel like Gerwig tried to torture who she feels are her favorite characters. She tortures Joe, who she says is her favorite character, to the one who she says she identifies with, but then makes Amy a hero. It has a feeling that she is not a big fan of Amy. I am so bewildered by her thought process. That is why this movie is dead last on our list. One of my friends said that when Beth died, she didn't feel anything in the movie because it did not show the close relationship that Joe had with Beth. When I watched the movie, I thought that Beth's death was only used as a vehicle for Joe to write the novel. Then in reality, we know that Louisa May Alcott's sister, Lizzie, died when she was in her 20s. It was not in any way the start of Joe's writing career. Her sister's death in the book changed Joe to become a better person because Beth's death leads to Joe having an identity crisis. She begins to revalue her own life after her sister passes away. That was entirely missing in this adaptation. I think it is a perfect scene in the 1994 film when Beth dies and she and Joe have that last chat together. We know on a writer's Joe goes to the window and watches this dark, gloomy autumn landscape. Branches are hitting the window and she is looking at the shadows in the night. Then she goes back to bed and she's dead. Joe's whole life has changed. It is an amazing scene in the 1994 film, but there's nothing like that in the 2019 film. 49 and 2018 films did Beth's dead also pretty well. 
One of my friends said quite recently, you know that scene when Freddy comes to court Jo in the 2019 film? Jo came downstairs and shuffled bread into her mouth and my friend said, Jo is supposed to be about 28 now. She has a guest. She lives in her parents' house. 2019 Jo doesn't do any work there. She just hangs out. She's kind of rude. She doesn't thank her mother. She behaves like she's a 15-year-old. I remember this article that I read about Louisa May Alcott. It was based on one of her letters that she wrote to her fans. And the fan was like, I was so sad that Joe didn't end up with Laurie and that Joe had to grow up. And Louisa May Alcott answered her. She wrote, Why to think that Joe is 15 or stays as a child when she is 30 in the end of the novel? Why people think that she's beautiful when she's written to be tall and nanky? That pretty much sums it up. Absolutely. I hope that one day we will get another adaptation that will wash out the bad taste in our mouth. I will wait for that one. That was the last ranking chat between I for now. Thank you everyone for listening. Being Christina, take care and make good choices. Bye.